songs throughout time and history is people get a new glimpse of God, a new experience of God, and they say, hey, I've got to, I've got to express that. I've got to write, write a new song. Um, so what Epiphany is, is, was actually technically yesterday, January the 6th. It is the celebration of the manifestation of God. It's a, it's a Greek word, epiphany. Epiphany is how Nan taught us to say it years ago. It comes from epiphaneo, uh, whereas phaneo is to reveal. Think of a phantom, right? A phantom is a, an apparition. So it's something that's revealed upon us. Here's my way of telling you what an epiphany is. My husband decided he wanted a new floor for Christmas, and uh, he was getting a little special gift from, from his work that was going to help pay for that, so I said, okay. And he sends me, he, does, he likes to do this, by the way, while I'm on vacation in Texas, which is a really good thing, because I can be a real jerk when it comes to telling somebody how to do something. So, uh, so it was really good for him to have that done while I was gone. And he sends me a picture when he's starting to move stuff out of the living room so the floor can be put in. And there's this, you know, empty room full of carpet. And then there's this big black streak down the left side of the room where the couch used to be. Right? So under the couch is a whole nother dog. Right? We, we have a dog, Jack, but I mean, there was fur, enough fur to make another dog under that couch. That was an epiphany. It revealed, it revealed something that we could not see. When the couch was moved, we could then see what was under the couch. Okay? So um, the, the kings who followed the star, the star led them to Bethlehem that revealed God's light in the Christ child. Uh, the shepherds had an epiphany of that angel before them saying, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Mary and Joseph had their own epiphany when Jesus was born in the manger. And then even Jesus himself has an epiphany um, when he grows up to be a man. And this is how Mark starts his gospel with Jesus's baptism by John the Baptist in the wilderness, and Jesus has an epiphany of who he really is. And so that's where our scripture is going to be today, is in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13, as we hear how Mark tells us that Jesus first came to know who he really was. So Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So does anybody here remember your baptism? Anybody here remember your baptism? Okay. Anybody remember what happened right after your baptism? Anybody? I remember right after my baptism, I was seven, by the way. My parents made me get baptized because we were getting ready to move, and they weren't sure what they were going to find elsewhere. So they said, you're getting done before you go. I was seven years old, and honest to Pete, I really didn't know what I was doing. So right after my baptism, this is what I remember. My older brother sitting next to me going, wet head, wet head, wet head, wet head. <laughs>
Huh? Does your brother count? Does your brother count? <laughs> awesome. So I don't know if you realize this, but many, many times in the lectionary readings, they will divide these two scriptures. Epiphany, as I just mentioned, is not only the celebration of the wise men following the star to find Jesus and the revelation of Jesus as a baby, but in the early church in particular, Epiphany was really the first Christmas celebrations, and, and it originally was more about his baptism than it was about his birth. So the baptism was when he was truly revealed to be God's son. So I, what, we, what, what usually happens with uh, church calendars and church history is we'll have this scripture about Jesus' baptism on Epiphany at the beginning of the, of the year, right after Christmas. And then we won't hear about this being driven out into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days until we get to Lent, until we get to the first Sunday of Lent, the time that we begin to prepare for Easter to come. So often these two scriptures will be separated. So while I traditionally do preach the lectionary, I have gone off track a little bit today because that's just how I am. But also because, uh, you know, Mark didn't have a church calendar telling him how to divide these scriptures. He's telling this story, and I wanted you to hear that immediately, and it's in your Bible, by the way, that word, immediately. It's Mark's favorite word, by the way, euthus. It appears many, many, many times in the Gospel of Mark. Notice, right after he comes up out of the water and hears, You are my beloved son, verse 12, and the Spirit immediately, say that with me, immediately drove him, say that, drove him out into the wilderness. Jesus' epiphany experience, his aha moment about who he is, drives him right into the wilderness for 40 days where he is tempted by Satan. He is with wild beasts and, thank goodness, angels attend to him. Now, I want to spend just a few minutes on these words immediately and drives him out. Okay, this is not Jesus deciding to go on spiritual retreat, right? This is not a decision. Drives him out immediately. The word there is ekbalo, and it literally in Greek means to throw out. Throw out. It's the same word that Mark uses throughout the gospel to, to describe what Jesus does with demons that are inside of people. He casts them out. He casts out demons. Everywhere you read through the gospel of Mark where it says he casts out demons, it's that same word, ekbalo. So the spirit literally ekbalos him, casts him out into the wilderness. It's the same word used when Jesus says, if your eye sins against you, pluck it out. Rather than, rather than go into hell, it's, it's better to go into heaven with one eye than into hell with two. So pluck out the bad eye, cast it out, ekbalo, same word. It's the same word that Mark uses to describe what Jesus does in the temple right after Palm Sunday when he comes in and sees those buying and selling in the temple. What does he do with them? Ekbalo! Say it! Ekbalo! He casts them out. Same word. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, ekbalos Jesus into the wilderness. He throws him out. I don't know about you, but I don't find that very comforting. It was a broken road that God led Jesus down after his baptism. And I think the reason for that is that's the only road that would lead Jesus to meet people like you and me who also live along broken roads. That's why the title of this series is Pressure Points. That's life for us. We live with pressure points. We have brokenness in our world and in our lives. Remember the great Leonard Cohen had a song, There's a Crack in Everything? Remember that? What is the other part of that? There's a crack in everything. You people listen to music at all? <laughs> no. 
Oh, come on. This isn't even my generation, and I know this. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. There's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. Now, I think that's a very astute statement. So it's actually kind of a depressing song, but I still think you should listen to it. Because When I say it's depressing, because it feels the brokenness of life. But it does have this positive tint to it, that in the brokenness, the light gets in. Now, I, I, I like what Leonard does there. I think he's almost got it. But I, I want to say not quite. What I think is that there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets out. That's how the light gets out. It's on the broken road that we as human beings have to decide who we really are, what we're really made of. For it is when we are broken that the light of God's Holy Spirit that comes into us through our very being, being created and born in the image of God, and that is confirmed in us when we are baptized. It's when we are broken that, that finally this armor that we've put on to protect us from the world is finally broken loose. And God's light can finally shine out of us. In other words, it's when our false self, the self that we've put on, is finally broken and our, our true self can shine forth. It's a pressure point. You see, we tend to think that when bad things happen to us, it's because we've done something wrong. Or we got bad luck. Or God hates us. Or the universe hates us. Or it's somebody else's fault. If they hadn't done that, or they had not done that, you know, you ever go through this? If they hadn't done what they did, or if I hadn't done what I did, or, or if I had not done what I should have done, or whatever, then this bad thing, this broken thing wouldn't have happened and I wouldn't be in such a bad place and in such a bad mood and I wouldn't be sad or angry or depressed or irritable or mean or whatever. I don't know if you ever go through that. I, I go through that a lot. You know, the truth is, and this is tough, I learned this actually through the grief recovery program we've done here at Twin Pines many times called Grief Share. The truth is, it's the pressure points in life that reveal what's inside us. It's not that the bad things, the broken things, the pressures in life, they don't make us that way. They only reveal what's already inside of us. As Yoda says, we are luminous beings. Luminous beings we are. <laughs> not this crude matter. <laughs> We are luminous beings filled with both light and dark, both flesh and spirit, good and bad. And when we have a pressure point and something bad breaks us, both light and dark shine through. The great epiphany that Jesus experiences in the wilderness these 40 days after his baptism and that I believe we can experience too, is that even just a little bit of God's light shines through the darkness, and the darkness has not and will not overcome it. For those of us who are declared beloved children of God, my beloved, my child with whom I am well pleased, we are with wild beasts on broken roads of the wilderness of life. And alongside of us are God's angels. And they help us to see God's Holy Spirit, God's light, rather than the darkness. They help us to make a choice to either let the darkness fill that crack, that brokenness, or to let the light shine and fill the broken places until we are healed and whole, children of light. One of my favorite uh, heroes in life is John Wooden, who is a great basketball coach for that other school over there on the West Coast. He says, you should be more concerned with your character than your reputation. 
Because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. I also would say our reputation is what we think we are. But our character is what we really are. You may have also heard character is what we do when no one is looking. I think character is what we are in the broken places. We really show who we are in the broken places of life. This is why the mystics emphasize that dark night of the soul. Because it's only in that darkness that we can truly find the light within us. And it takes great faith. It's not easy. Anybody who tells you being a Christian is easy is lying, lying, lying like a dog on a rock. Lying like a rock, lying like a dog on a rock. It takes great faith and great courage to face the darkness of life. Another one of my mentors, Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr is a Catholic uh, priest says, wild beasts and angels reside in the same wilderness, but it takes the Spirit of God to drive you there. He quotes William Butler Gates, who says, it takes more courage to examine the dark corners of your own soul than it does for a soldier to fight on a battlefield. I think that's true. I've never been a soldier, but I'm just guessing that if I'm on a battlefield, I know there's a good chance I'm not going to live. And that'll be scary, and, not, and there's no doubt there's tremendous terror in that. But to face the dark corners of my soul means I have to live to tell about it. <laughs> I have to live through it. And that is terrifying. One of my practices this Epiphany season, I started it in Advent, and I'm going to continue it in Epiphany, is to have massage. To go have a, a body massage where they work on the pressure points. I found a therapist who actually uses the pressure points. I'm not suggesting this for anybody else. It's just for me. But I'm going to tell you about a little aha moment I had. I went to get a massage early in Advent because I was having some great difficulty with, with actually a nerve on my, on my left side here. And it was actually a conversation with Walter Hale who said... Your nerve's not right, Benny. you got to get that worked on. And he suggested a chiropractor, which I, I thought would be a great idea. But I thought, well, I've, I've been to massage before. I'll start with that. And I went, and this guy worked on the pressure points. And when he did, I did what I always do, which is I was very intense. I know y'all don't know that about me. <laughs> So if you're visiting for the first time today, they know me really well. I was so intense. I was fighting it. I was, you know, just pressing on this place where my body's all out of whack. And all of a sudden, I heard this voice say, Benny, quit resisting. Let him break that. Let him push through. And I quit resisting. And the moment I quit resisting, my nerve came unlocked in my back. Because I allowed the light to get out through that broken place. That's what I'm encouraging us to do in this epiphany series of pressure points. Yes, we're celebrating the light of the star that led the kings to Jesus. And yes, we're celebrating... Jesus realizing God's call in his life at his baptism. But today, we're also celebrating the shadow side of Epiphany. Because wherever there is light, there is a shadow. The shadow side of Epiphany. How the wilderness road, the wild beasts, and even the devil himself can be a pathway to true healing and wholeness. It's only in the wilderness that we truly see what's under the couch of our life. <laughs> Today as we go into our time of prayer, I want us to celebrate that even on this broken road, 
There are angels of God to attend us. We could never make it without them. And today as we offer our own prayers for whatever brokenness it is in our lives or the lives of others that we want to ask for God's light to shine through that brokenness, through that pressure point of life. I also want to remind you that, um, that those angels are real. Joyce Prophet told me this morning that this is an award our blanketeer group received from the Fayette County Sheriff's Office for the blankets that we uh, make and provide for children who experience trauma. And the sheriffs, the sheriff, the, the county sheriffs keep these, uh, and the deputies, they keep these blankets in their cars. And so anytime they're, they come upon a trauma with a child um, who's experienced some brokenness in life, they give them one of our blankets. And I think of that as like the angel with Jesus in the wilderness with the wild beast. And so I both want us to remember and give thanks for the blanketeers as well as to remember those children who our blankets are reaching. But also in your own way, through your prayer, whether you put a prayer in the prayer box or light a candle or just stay in your chair, I want you to feel the blanket of God's Holy Spirit wrapped around you and attending you along the broken roads of life. Let us pray. Thank mm -hmm. you. 